if you Okay, hi. So I'm here with Megan O'Rourke. Thanks for being with me this morning. We're here to talk about your book, The Invisible Kingdom. Um, so I, we've had some trouble scheduling this. It's been taken <laughs> a few schedules, so I'm very glad to be seeing you. It is early for me here, six in the morning in California. Um, so why don't you just give us like a you know very short summary of the, the arc of your illness when you got sick and you had a number of years of not knowing what it was, and then you got um, Lyme diagnosis, and now you're kind of better, but sort of not fully better. Yeah, you've summarized it so well. First of all, thanks so much for having me, David. I'm, I'm really, uh, have been excited to have this conversation with you. Yes, so one of the things that I say about my illness, which I think is true of some people who have the kind of chronic illness I have, is that it's really hard to pinpoint the beginning, right? It didn't start with a, a very noticeable trigger that was clear cut. <laughs> Could it be identified, but rather I started experiencing a strange host of symptoms in my early 20s, shortly after graduating from college. Um, things like strange burning sensations over my body and electric shocks uh, that would flicker all over my arms and legs and were so painful that it would actually make my legs sort of twitch and spasm. Um, strange bouts of fatigue where some of the time I was fine and then sometimes I was just enervated um, and brain fog, joint pain, just a lot of what I thought of as little things started cropping up and happening and then did really you have some brain fog at that point? I mean, that was not something that that's a term that we now know everyone no, from COVID. I had no way of understanding it. I called it the foggy feeling because it really is like a foggy feeling. I mean, it's sort of like your brain is made of molasses or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I could identify it and I could even identify certain triggers for it, but um, it was very hard to understand what it was and no one, and to even talk about it. But I remember one day at work, taking a break with a coworker and saying, do you ever just feel really exhausted and strange? And like I was starting to search for answers and try to understand it, but I also didn't really know that I was sick. Um, I would have these drenching night sweats every night and have to change my clothes, but 9-11 had happened. And I thought, well, maybe I'm having an anxiety response to 9-11. And it, mm -hmm. you know, I was also, you know, and one reason I thought that was that one symptom actually was incredibly violent nightmares, which, make sense later when you understand a little bit about tick-borne infections but so it was murky and hard to identify at first and then at some point in my 30s I just went off a cliff and really got sick and it was very apparent to people and myself that I was sick and at that point I started more urgently telling doctors we really needed to find answers and just often being blown off or dismissed and being told, look, it's probably anxiety or stress until I found a great um, doctor who specializes in women's health. And she was immediately thinking autoimmune disease and immediately credited everything I was saying. It was like, something's going on. You're not imagining this. And so she helped me go down the path that led me to these eventual diagnoses of both autoimmune disease and Lyme disease. I have some other things too, but those are sort of the main buckets. Mm -hmm. And so then you got some treatment for those. Yeah, so I was I was treated for one of my autoimmune diseases. I'm, I have autoimmune thyroiditis, and they can really help you with that. Um, and that pretty much stabilized. But I have some autoimmune stuff that no one can really identify or even treat, and it's low enough level that it hasn't been quite worth it to medicate it. But we mm -hmm. don't know how much that activity makes me feel sick or doesn't, right? And then I got treated with antibiotics for Lyme disease and that really turned my health around mm -hmm. so that I'm still someone who deals with symptoms and issues all the time. I still have autoimmune disease and some autonomic nervous system disorders and joint problems, but it's, it's more of a kind of manageable chronic illness as opposed to what it was, which was a life altering condition that had me pretty much bed bound at my sickest. Right. And so do you, what's your self identity at this point? Are you a sick, chronically ill person? Are you, what, how do you yeah. think of yourself and how do you present yourself? I think what's really complicated is that it changes, right? So I think when I'm doing pretty well, I try to almost ignore it. <laughs> and that's probably my own version of denial and coping is that when I'm doing well, I try not to think about it too much. I, I at this point have a lot of you might call them coping mechanisms. You might call them hacks, like life hacks. I have a system of behaviors and 
kind of strategies that really help me get by to the point where sometimes I feel like a healthy person, but I'm only healthy insofar as I really stick to those um, strict habits and mm -hmm. routines. And then what I would say is that, you know, actually for the past six months, I've been pretty symptomatic again. So it's, I do feel much more like a sick person who is, you know, chronically ill. Like I, I really do you know, know that I'm dealing with these symptoms and I have to build time into my life to manage them and see my doctors and do the things I need to do. If that makes sense. So how, one of the things I think that you talk about a lot, well, first let's talk about the name change of the book. Um, uh, I forget, actually I have it in my notes, but I forget what the original title was. Um, the Night Side. The night side, okay, right. And then, uh, and you've changed it to The Invisible Kingdom. I have the book, but I have taken the thing off. So <laughs> people can't see the nice cover. Um, so you changed The Invisible Kingdom. So what was that change about? Yeah, so the, first of all, I'm really terrible at titles. Titles are very hard for me. So we had kind of come to The Night Side as a provisional title that we were all okay with. It is taken from um, the first line of Susan Sontag's great book, Illness as Metaphor, mm -hmm. which is a kind of godmother of my book. It's it's very much the presiding spirit um, that helps shape my own thinking about uh, the invisible kingdom. In that book, she talks about the ways in which um, when we don't understand a disease as a culture, we tend to stigmatize or psychologize it. And that the problem with that is that it leads to kind of incuriosity about the actual nature of the illness, the biological realities of it. It can prevent research and it can make the experience of people who are sick harder because they're dealing with a kind of cultural narrative about their illness that may not match up with the reality of their own experience and actually their own biology, you know, and it kind of obscures the biological reality. So this was very much what I was writing about. She was talking about breast cancer in the 70s, where, which was thought of as a disease of repressed emotions, um, uh, something she very much objected to as a feminine, you know, in her own way, a feminist and intellectual. Right. She was like, I think this is really anti-knowledge anti to just assume that, right, people are repressing their emotions and it's also very, misogynist and right so I was really interested in the ways that today what seemed to me like, like the signature illness that this happening to are these poorly understood ongoing chronic conditions like myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia autoimmune disease etc so I knew I wanted her language in the title mm -hmm. um, and she has this great quote at the beginning of the book which is illness is the night side of life and she goes on to say, you know, we're all members of the kingdom of the sick and the kingdom of the well, but we, we really don't want to use the passport to the kingdom of the sick. Um, and, you know, as we were getting closer to publication, I just kept thinking, hmm, there's something a little vague about the night side, right? If you hear it, you don't know what it refers to. It doesn't quite, mm -hmm. have a poet, right? So I think a lot about language and phrasing and image. And also whether, whether it pops for someone who hasn't read Sontag, say, or something. Okay. Exactly. The night side just seemed a little vague, a little soft, a little abstract, right? The poet knew it was like, it's not an image, it's abstract, you can't see it. Um, and so we kept thinking about it. And my editor and I were talking about the nature of the kingdom in her title, but we didn't want to call it the kingdom of the sick. That seemed too, um, it, it seemed too much like we were narrowing the identity of sick people to just being sick, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know, actually, I think my husband and I were batting around titles and I was talking about, okay, I want invisibility in there because so much of my book is about the fact that when you have these diseases, when there's, you know, stigmatizing narratives around them, they actually render you invisible in some way. Mm -hmm. So that's where we got to, my husband and I were batting around ideas. And I think he actually first said, what about the invisible kingdom? And I was like, yes, that's it. Because you can see it and hear it right away. It's an image that encapsulates what the book is about, which is this idea that there is an invisible kingdom of people, a realm of people out there whom the well often don't see, but are living their lives suffering, whether they're at home bed bound or out and about and among us, but hiding their symptoms and realities because it's just so hard in this culture to be open about living with chronic illness. Um, I, I've had just a secondary hint of that. You know, when I started writing about this and you would call editors, to say, hi, I want to write about chronic fatigue syndrome. And you can hear in the, over the phone, their eyes rolling in their head, like, no, what's this crazy Tuller person again calling us and wanting to write about chronic fatigue syndrome? 
right. what, you know, and it, it so I mean, it's, it's only incredibly nothing compared to what people actually experience having it, but I've just gotten sort of what I think of as a secondary echo of that response mm. sometimes from when I've sort of talked about this is what I'm, I'm, I'm writing about or, or, or you know. Yeah. Um, so what about that? Um, my experience in writing about this is that there are many more people than I had realized that are, I, I don't see because they're homebound or because they're not out there. And that, uh, you know, I've, I've been surprised at, oh, another homebound person I hear about or another buddy, you know, who's not out there. Did you find when you were going through your journey that there were many more people um, acknowledging to you, oh, I have this chronic illness, but I don't talk about it or things like that? Yeah, it was it was a profound experience of coming to terms not just with my own illness, but realizing that I was as lonely as I felt, and I felt very alone. Um, I was actually one of millions, right? And there was a quite vivid moment in the journey where that happened, where I had been dismissed by a doctor um, in Manhattan who had just been really rude to me, and I went outside and I just felt this sense of despair and like how can this be real, right? I'm really sick and I'm going and I'm trying to tell the person who's supposed to care about me about it. And she's shrugging me off. Like, how did we end up here? And I felt so despondent. And I remember just leaning against this car and having one of those flashes where I was like, well, I'm not alone. There's so many of us, right? Because if this is happening to me, it must be happening to many, many more people. At that point too, I was on Facebook groups and I was on Twitter groups and, you know, or not Twitter groups, but social media and seeing Mm -hmm. how many people were, were sick. When I first started getting sick, which was 2012, there wasn't as much discourse about it on some social media platforms like Twitter. There were all these big patient platforms. And I think that also shaped my sense of both the scope of the problem, which was astonishing, and the urgency of the problem and how much you know, what led me to write the book was not the urge to tell my own story, but really to tell our collective story, which also brings us back to the title, right? It's really pointing to, to the fact that this isn't about me, this is about this kingdom and mm -hmm. how urgently we need to think about it and find strategies for helping people. So one of the things, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, being a poet uh, and um, so obviously language is something that's, you know, important to you. And one of the themes in the book is sort of the difficulty of finding language or the paucity of language or the, 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 the lack of, I don't know what it is, the lack of good words or just the experience is so overwhelming, it's hard to describe. What did you experience in terms of trying to find words, uh, uh, you know, to put to your experience? Yeah, well, you know, so I'm a writer. I've been a writer pretty much my whole life. I'm a poet. I'm a journalist. I'm someone who uses language to connect to other people. You know, I think of myself as kind of an introvert who likes people and likes bursts of social contact. And I think crucially, what was so hauntingly strange about this experience was, in effect, to be going into crisis and to not have any way to communicate it to others um, and to not have any way to make it legible. And as I've said, to go to doctors and find that the very people who were supposed to help, right, were turning me away. And I really experienced this as a problem of language and as a problem of narrative too, right? Which is to say, I, I had the strong sensation that if there were better words and if there were pre-existing kind of cultural apparatuses or narratives for thinking about my condition, I would not be struggling so much to make my illness legible. Um, so there is, a, there is a narrative. The narrative is we can't find out what it is. Therefore, right. you're having stress and anxiety or depression. Right. It's not even we can't find out what it is. It's just you're having stress and anxiety. Right? It's, like, right. like, it's, it's actually, but you know, that to me was obviously not the real narrative, right? Um, because I could just tell that something other than stress and anxiety was going on. So, yeah. So I think I just was quite haunted by the, the fact that it was so hard to put this into language. And that, as you've said, like this foggy feeling, what, how, what was the word for that, right? Um, eventually one comes to brain fog, but even brain fog is a term that so easy to, easy to slip past if you've never experienced it in a debilitating way. I think it just sounds like, oh, a slightly fuzzy day, right? Which we've all had. Um, mm -hmm. when in fact, it can be so incredibly debilitating that it actually erases your very sense of having a coherent selfhood because 
the functions that your brain is made to do, the kind of cognitive processing are just not happening, right? So that at my very sickest, um, I lost a lot of language, which is another reason the book is so preoccupied with language, which is to say that, you know, I'm someone who thinks in words and images and makes a living writing. And when I was at my sickest, I it was so, the brain fog was so extreme that I couldn't think of words like spring. I couldn't think of, you know, I don't know, just basic English language phrases that would help me communicate to others. So I was actually kind of locked in this space where I couldn't read because I couldn't process language and I couldn't write and it was very hard to teach. So I think that's a big reason this book is so concerned with all this is not only do others lack do I lack language to communicate myself to others, but I, the, the very nature of the disease was to rob me of language. Oh, and one of the things also, so that I, if you're robbed of language, are you robbed of sort of a narrative for yourself? Are you robbed of sort of a, a story about yourself as well? Yeah, I, I, it's funny. It's very hard to describe to anyone, um, especially because I, my illness really went in stages, but at the sickest, when I was in the, the lowest stage, the real nadir of the illness, I... And when, how many years ago would that have been? That was from 2013, that was from the end of 2012 to the spring of 2014, 2014. Oh, I think I began being treated for Lyme disease. So about a year, so it was almost 10 years ago. Um, and I mean, I'd been pretty sick before that, but this was a really deep sickness that was different um, where I truly began to despair because this level of suffering was so high that if one way to think about it is sort of in the beginning of the sickness, it was like there were periods of being okay and functional and periods of being sick. And they were, I was mostly okay and a little bit sick. And then gradually the sickness took over all my mm -hmm. time to the point where if when I was truly sick every day I was sick but I still usually had like two good hours or three good hours when I got to my sickest I had really no good hours and I hadn't I couldn't work at all um and I remember at the time that I had this sensation that it was as if my it's hard to talk about because it can sound like I was experiencing anxiety or depression but I had the sensation that my brain had been kind of invaded and that which I think is what happened I had an infection mm -hmm. um, and that, that sense of self that it's sort of a central self that really was was on and it was just because I was so so sick that to do anything like to sit upright in a chair took so much concentration and will these things that we're used to doing right that our autonomic nervous system just helps us do and your muscles my body was struggling to do so yeah I had this real sense that there was still this pilot flame of myself somewhere there but that the person I had known was gone and not just because I couldn't work in the ways I was used to, but also because it was so hard to just move from room to room. And this is something I'm hearing from a lot of long COVID patients too, right? That the, that the thing about brain fog when it's this severe and being this sick is that incapacitation is so extraordinary. It robs you, you know, you may not be, you may not have died, but possibilities of your life have died, right? The life you knew it has, no. has died. The life you knew it, yeah. Um, what does that do and what did that do to your relationships? I mean, uh, obviously this is not an illness just of the person, it's an illness that impacts everybody in the family or that you have contact with. And you've managed, uh, it seems to maintain your relationship with your partner or your husband um, and have two kids now. So, uh, but yeah. how that, it affected those relationships. Um, it was really hard. I mean, I think that I was incredibly lucky in that Jim, my partner, always believed me. I mean, I think he was one of the very first people to say, I think really something is going on with you because it, again, happened so slowly over time. So he really did. He saw it up close and he saw how much was going on. So he credited me. But as I try to write about in the book, even that was challenging because of course it's exhausting for the caretaker, right? I mean, it was stressful for him too. Like we were looking at me losing income. I lost a fair amount of income. We, you know, our lives were being materially impacted by this. Our sense of possibility was changing, right? Because I couldn't do things anymore. And I was consumed and preoccupied by my own, you know, I don't know, the, the challenges of living this way. As anybody would be, it's not like you become, you know, if, if I have a little cold that I don't, you know, you become people when they're sick 
think right. about you're not yourself. right and you're, you're you're not yourself as it right you think about yeah you just don't have the energy to live live the life as one so i think that was really hard and i think that pretty much everyone i've talked to who's really sick even when you have a supportive partner you do feel cocooned in isolation right um and it's very hard i think if you haven't experienced these things to understand how truly debilitating they are in an ongoing way and so there were times where and even now there's times where he just forget i mean to him it's ordinary right to him my symptoms are ordinary to me they remain pressing and extraordinary each time right because you don't ever really get used to it and so there's this essential kind of existential divide that um i think only other sick people can truly understand and so there's just now always this divide that is just a reality and how did you have with your kids? How do you do you explain to them or do they what do they notice or what do they I mean, they're I think three and five, I think I saw recently on yeah. Twitter. So that's an age where they start to mommy sick, they can sort of tell what's going on a bit. They can tell they've seen me sometimes when I'm experiencing these electric um, electric shocks that I described, which are pretty overwhelming and so I always have a visceral reaction to them like you can see I think on my face that I'm in quite a lot of pain and so my now five-year-old first saw that when he was three and he said mommy what's wrong what's wrong you know he was really worried and so I've had to tell them like sometimes I'm sick and I have Lyme disease and you know this is what happens to me periodically I'm not totally well I still have these symptoms um and you know, it's hard to know what they process. There's a lot I don't tell them, but I, I've tried to be very honest when they do ask questions. My approach is always to sort of believe they know what they need to know. And so if they're asking, they do need right. to know. Right. But it's challenging for them. The other day, my son said, um, oh, I, I want you to come to the student parent day, but maybe you're going to have electric shocks and you won't be able to come, right? So he's aware that in some ways I'm not totally well all the time. Yeah. That must be tough sometimes. Yeah, yeah, it's sad. It's sad to see. It's sad to see. Yeah. Um, so when you were writing your book, obviously nobody had heard of COVID or COVID-19 or when you were starting it anyway. Um, some people knew about coronaviruses, but you know, it wasn't something on anybody's mind. So now your book comes out and it comes out right in the middle of this epidemic of what we're calling long COVID. Um, what about the synchronicity of that? Uh, or the coincidence of that? Or do you think it's just a fact that you're writing about something that, as you say, is sort of something of our time? So that yeah. synchronicity is natural, I mean. Is it, is it synchronous? Is it sort of a weird coincidence? Or is it the zeitgeist bringing a book at the time when the book might be yeah. relevant? Yeah. It's really, it's the timing question as, um, you know, as a writer, you only have so much control over timing, right? And so there's just, there is this strange synchronicity. I, I will say that I was pretty much done with the book and a big part of the book was about the ways in which some of these seemingly mysterious, well, not seemingly, mis still mysterious conditions, um, such as myalgic encephalomyelitis, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, et cetera, the, a factor in them probably was infection, right? And that, and I had a chapter where I was talking about the emergence of this paradigm of thinking about disease, which is more nuanced than the old um, germ theory model where, you know, basically a germ invades the body, the body responds roughly the same way, and then you either die or get better. Right. And I had laid out in the book, well, actually, there's all these researchers doing this really fascinating research that has a kind of new paradigm of disease, which says that a lot of these chronic illnesses may be, in fact, infection associated and infection plays a big role in the dysregulation of the immune system and autoimmune disease and other things. And so I had laid all that out. So as COVID started coming, I was talking to all these virologists and you know, I was worried, they were worried not just about the acute wave of infection that was about to hit, but I, you know, no one was talking about the idea that maybe it would bring with it a wave of chronic illness. And it was pretty clear to me that that was certainly possible. And I remember saying to my husband, because he was like, look, you're probably not someone who would die from COVID. And I said, I'm not necessarily worried about dying from COVID. I am worried about what COVID might do to my body permanently in the sense of leaving damage in its wake. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, this is a long way of saying, I had pretty much finished the book and then I just started reading around a lot and going on Facebook and going into patient message boards and seeing that these 
communities sprang up really quickly in the spring of 2020 saying, look, I'm still sick. And I realized that I couldn't hand in the book. I had to pause and really follow this out. So I spent 2020 pretty much reporting on long COVID and eventually writing a piece about it for the Atlantic, some form of which goes into the book because it just seemed like it would have been premature. Right? And in fact, you know, long COVID is now this incredibly important, incredibly widespread condition that is just, you know, a mass disabling event potentially. Um, or a mass psychosis or a mass hysterical event if you think, listen to certain, you know, some, some perspectives. Right, which I don't listen to because I don't think the evidence is there and there's plenty of other evidence right. about its you know, physiological reality. So, and even if, you know, it's certainly this, right, mass disabling event of some kind. And it just felt like really urgent to put that in and to follow that out. And I also just didn't want to do that thing where you report on it for two weeks and stick it in. I really hate books that sort of opportunistically take up something. So I felt, look, this is what I'm really writing about here. We have this, you know, once in a century crisis that mimics other crises we've had and is going to shine a light on those crises, I hope and hope. I got to really report this out. So it took a whole another year and a half. I took a whole another two years to finish the book because- so was both, It would have been coming, it would have come out sooner. I mean, your editors were okay with that, uh, taking advantage of that delay. Yeah, I think they felt as I did that just intellectually, I had to, right? Like intellectually, I had to, yeah, I couldn't write about this phenomenon and not write about this huge, un Folding tragedy. I mean, uh, yes, I have great editors in house that publishing house. They were very patient. They let me take ten years to write this book. So, uh, um, what? Did, so, did you, had you heard of ME before, or presumably you'd heard of chronic fatigue syndrome? And what? What was your thought before about people with chronic fatigue syndrome? Or did you have similar? You know, before I was reporting about it, I probably had similar experiences or feelings that many people have or the knee jerk or chronic fatigue syndrome. What is that, you know, kind of thing. So had you heard about it as an entity or what was your impression and how did that change? So I had a friend in high school whose mother had chronic fatigue syndrome. That's what we were told at the time. And that was how she explained it. And I have to say in the way of 15 year olds, you know, I was not very sympathetic. And I, I mean, I think just in general, human reality was abstract and he's still, you know, my, my 15 year olds don't always tend to be very sympathetic to anything. <laughs> my, like many teenagers, I was very focused on myself, I'm sure. But I do remember thinking like, this seems weird and fake. And she was often kind of lying on the couch. And I just, I had no, I think that actually that experience is the sort of backstory for a lot of this, which is that I had no framework for understanding what was wrong with her. Um, and it, the disease had this weird, not very scientific, I shouldn't say weird, but it had this not very scientific name, chronic fatigue syndrome, fatigue. And it's like, we're all tired. So it just seemed like, well, if you're fatigued, why can't you will yourself out of it, right? Um, and so I think when I first got sick, I remember thinking so much about her and thinking, oh my God, you know, the assumptions I made this is the assumption everyone's making, right? And and here are the reasons. We don't have a framework. We don't have the right language. Fatigue is a misleading word. Fatigue is a terrible word for this. It's a terrible word. It's a terrible word because it's not, what, what patients are experiencing is not fatigue. It's, it's a kind of cellular enervation. It's a kind of cellular dysfunction, right? Mitochondrial problems, whatever they might be. Anyway, you know, along, so anyway, I had had that, yeah, sort of dismissive response. Um, but one of the first diagnoses I was offered, which I met the criteria for was MECFS. So before I had the Lyme diagnosis, I was also given by various doctors an MECFS diagnosis because I had posted, you know, I had a lot of the markers for it. Like I would exercise and get worse. Right. I would faint a lot, yeah. So, um, so you had you had some structure for it, but not not very much. And what I've seen, what I think I've seen, is that on the one hand, while there are some people who want to put this in the same uh, psychological template as they saw MECFS, other people seem to have taken the long COVID phenomenon and said, "Oh my God, maybe we got things wrong with ME." I mean, there really does seem to be some this seems to have opened up more attention to sort of post-viral yeah. syndromes and post-viral conditions that we formerly didn't pay much attention to or sort of dismissed. Yeah. 
I think we're very, very lucky that a few of the people who are leading long COVID research and treatment are quite open-minded and that also the urgency and scope of the problem has led to more communication among a certain coterie of researchers than before. And so I've been on the phone the past couple of weeks reporting on a potential new long COVID piece. Um, and what I'm really struck by is how many of them have said to me, we know medicine has done wrong by MACFS mm -hmm. and we have to bring that along with us. We know medicine has done wrong by post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome or chronic Lyme we have to also bring those people along. And there's this real sense, and actually there was just, you know, I think the David Percino's lab yesterday on Twitter was saying something like, we've not included them yeah. because yes. we don't know about it. You know, so you see this, right? You see this. Um, Mr. David Petrino, he has a lab at Mount Sinai, we're a long COVID lab and he's a, an Australian doctor and he's been very proactive in terms of treating long COVID and recognizing it as non-psychological in nature. Yeah. Uh, non-psychiatric in nature. Exactly. So he's one of the people I reported on for my Atlantic piece, which was a really early piece about long COVID. I followed him as he was trying to figure out from like April, May on, what is this? When they really had no idea what was going on, right? And he's been very open-minded. Um, he actually has a sort of, his role at Mount Sinai as a, as a someone who works in um, rehabilitation is to be innovative. And so he's found these innovative ways to think about these diseases. And I think there's a whole group of researchers and clinicians who have that approach. And also the scope of the problem, the fact that so many doctors and healthcare workers are experiencing long COVID is also helping a little bit. That said, we're obviously up against this incredible bureaucracy and ways in which medicine is really set in its way. So we're, we're you know, my hope is that we're really, it's not going to be instant. It's not going to be fast enough to really help the people who need it now. Right. But I'm like, I think keeping the media pressure and the kind of clinical and research pressure on, we have to break open the ways we've been thinking about and talking about and, and researching these diseases. And we have to use new technologies that are available to bear down and really start to look in complicated and, and, um, I don't know, innovative ways, which some of these researchers are at what might be going on, because it's a lot of different things that are going on, a lot of patients. I think well, there's a lot of different kinds of things. And that's one thing, one of the things that makes it so uh, uh, difficult. And with long COVID, the, the, the impacts seem to be really pretty. I mean, they're sort of all over the place in some ways. So it seems hard to exactly in individual cases track what's going on. Um, I think uh, I've pretty much asked you most of the questions I wanted to ask you. I'm sure afterwards I'll remember um, things I, I didn't ask. Um, so I think I'm just gonna say thank you. I'm gonna um, stop the recording. Maybe we can talk for a few minutes after, um, but I think I've gotten everything I need. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? No, or? that's great, that's great. Um, okay, hold on. Uh, thank you for, for doing this. Oh, uh, thank you so much for having me.